2020 is turning out to be quite an unprecedented year, filled with so many unprecedented moments. So many moments we will never forget, most notably April 2nd, the day I introduced the Scritcher. Just as the plague threatened to take away our God-given ability to touch, I delivered a solution so simple, so pure, that it marks the beginning of a new era. For on that day, We didn't just learn what it is to touch. That day, we learned how to feel. Well, today is yet another remarkable day. Today, our world becomes a little bit smaller. Introducing the Scritcher Mini. <laughs> Darn it. Hey friends, welcome to Make Anything. It's Devin here and if you're wondering where I've been, well, it took six weeks of method acting to nail that bit. And no, you're not dreaming. I did, in fact, shrink down the Scritcher into the Scritcher Mini. When I released the first thing a couple weeks ago, the biggest request I got was to make it even smaller. So I took the time to shrink down my original design into an even tinier Scritcher. I'm really surprised at how well it works at this scale. It's still entirely print in place, so it's just got these really tiny print in place hinges and this thin strip of PLA that gives it this really nice flexible property. I gotta say, it scritches better than ever. Anyways, as many of you may know, I recently redesigned my Astrolabicon puzzle into the Astrolabicon Pro. It's the same puzzle, but it uses these ABS beads I got off of eBay and the tolerances and clearances are just fine tuned a little bit more so that it works really well now. Here I took two of my favorite styles, the Astrolabicon Pro with these really cool swoops and the Astrolabicon Retro with these grooves and I combined them to make what is now the Astrolabicon Retro Pro, I suppose. That said, I'm not gonna just keep recycling the same old ideas. I know Angus made a new puzzle, which means I have to design a new puzzle. And that's why I'm bringing you guys quite a doozy with this thing right here, which I call the chain. As with my other twist puzzles, the objective with the chain here is pretty simple. We have these ABS marbles running along these two tracks, and the goal is to get all the like colors touching, like they are right here. Of course, these two halves twist, which leads to co-mingling between the different tracks, and that's how all these colors get mixed up. Well, in this case, you can see there's only two colors. This is kind of my simplified version of the chain since it's already pretty tricky just trying to get these two colors together. As you can see, the tracks shift depending on the position of the puzzle. Sometimes you've got this big 18 marble track wrapped around a smaller 12 marble track, whereas in this other position, you'll have two equal 15 ball tracks that are linked together like a chain. As if that isn't tricky enough, here's my less simplified version of the puzzle with six different colors. In this case, we have five marbles of every color and that makes things especially tricky because that doesn't divide up so neatly with the two halves of this puzzle. And even just one quarter twist can change a lot of things all at once. Honestly, this version intimidates me quite a bit, so if you guys have any favorite puzzle YouTubers who you think would be 
better suited at solving this puzzle, let me know in the comments. As it turns out, I just got a new shipment of ABS beads. So why don't we go ahead and assemble one of these chain puzzles right now? I actually designed a retro styling of this chain puzzle as well. And here it is. I've still got the support materials in there, but I did already glue in some magnets since we want to give those some time so that they don't just pull each other apart. Here's a closer look at that retro design. I printed these with Spider Maker's matte brown PLA, which works really well for this style. As I said, we've got support material here, which isn't completely necessary, but it does make for a cleaner print and it's pretty satisfying to pop out. Well, I'll find that someday. So yeah, here are our two halves. I've already got the magnets glued in, but for it to properly rotate, we need to add this little clip. So that'll pop right in the center here and it should twist pretty freely. Now let's go ahead and select our colors. All these beads I got off of eBay have a similar silky pastel finish, which I actually think works really well with this matte PLA print. Now we'll go ahead and load up our puzzle. Like I said, there's five of every color and it can get a little bit tricky to keep all the marbles in there. But once we've got it all in there and in order, we'll go ahead and stick the two halves together. One way to do that is to use your dexterous fingers to hold all of these beads in place while you turn it over and stick the halves together. But I can also use the same assembler that I printed out for my Astrolabicon and that makes it a little bit easier to keep things in place. And there we have yet another really cool chain puzzle. Even though there are a lot of colors here, I think they work together quite well, especially with this brown retro puzzle. You may notice that there's a little bit of resistance with this marble track, and well, it turns out that even these ABS beads still have a bit of a tolerance, which leads to some being larger than others. So this design, which has the same number of marbles and it's the same size and everything, well, here we have the marbles moving a lot more easily. So there's still a bit of variance, even with these plastic beads. I guess that means I'll be designing a second version of the puzzle with just slightly altered dimensions. So it'll work with those larger beads as well. So there we have it, the chain, another very cool puzzle. I think this might be the trickiest one I've designed. So I'm excited to see how you guys fare with it. And maybe one day, even I, can break the chain. Let's go ahead and move on and direct our attention to this side of the table where we have all sorts of fancy colorful looking rectangles. These are actually all protective cases for this thing. And this is the OP1. It's one of my favorite products that I own. It's a little musical synthesizer by a company known as Teenage Engineering. And while this thing looks and feels very playful, it is an extremely powerful instrument as well. Uh, you can record full tracks on it, you can make beats, you can sample sounds from around the world, you can do all sorts of things with it. It's really fun and I shared it a little bit during a live stream where I actually measured and redesigned this entire instrument in Fusion 360 for the purpose of making all sorts of different attachments and mods for it. And these cases are the first accessories that I've made for my OP1. I have some custom knobs as well, but that'll be for another video. Today I just want to focus on these really cool cases and the techniques I used to get these colorful designs. The design of the case here itself isn't too complicated. This top wall just presses onto the OP1. It's a friction fit, which is possible due to the flexible nature of this material and the thicknesses that I designed it with. And of course it took a few iterations to get the friction fit just right but now it works surprisingly well. Of course, this is printed with PLA, which can warp over time. So I also got these silicone bands, which will make sure that this definitely stays on. So that's how it protects the keyboard. But what's really cool about this case is that it also acts as a stand, which slightly tilts up the OP1 and makes it more comfortable to play.
Pretty cool, right? These are some of my original designs, and while it may look really complex, really it's just a bunch of extruded circles and lines which I combined to make this pretty cool composition. The entire design is just a 0.4 millimeter extrude cut into the face of this OP1 case. And by doing that, you can basically just swap out the filament at 0.4 millimeter layer height, and then you can switch it out for another color and get that two color effect. Most slicers have an option to pause your printer at a certain Z height, but what I like to do in Simplify 3D is actually create two separate files. The first print is cut off at 0.4 millimeters so that it's really just these first two layers with the pattern. And I'll actually go into the ending script here and put these semicolons in front of the commands to turn off the extruder and bed so that they stay heated because once that print is done, I'm just gonna go ahead and run the second print. And for this one, I'll actually have it start at 0.4 millimeters. So it's just starting where the last print left off. If we take a look at the slice preview for that second half, you can see it's actually floating above the bed of the build plate. And if we look at the travel moves, it also moves up right away to that 0.4 millimeter height so that it avoids the print underneath it. By printing those two files one after the other with two different filaments, we can end up with this really cool multicolored print. It's a pretty simple technique and it produces really awesome results straight off the print bed, especially when you have really detailed illustrations like I made here with this Red Eye series, which was inspired by long sleepless nights spent searching for inner harmony. I also designed a few other cases using the same techniques. Here we have a scallop pattern, which is especially cool thanks to the transition filament that I used on the back. And then there's this interference pattern, which I printed with one of my favorite filaments, which is Filamentum's Wizard Voodoo. It's the same filament I used for this case, which has another really cool technique that creates a kind of holographic effect, especially with this duochrome filament. Getting an effect like this involves making really thin cuts into the surface of the model. So the width of these lines is just 0.1 millimeter, and again, it's an extrude cut 0.4 millimeters deep. And the magic happens when we bring it into our slicer and use a concentric external infill. Basically, you're forcing the slicer to create outlines wherever you made these really thin cuts, even though it's basically fusing it all together into one continuous sheet. And the result is that really cool shimmering effect. Then there's this print, which was actually just made using the blank version of the model, but by setting the solid bottom layers to zero in my slicer, I was able to expose this triangular infill and combined with a filament swap, well, that's another way to create this really cool pattern. Of course, I also had to print a few versions using the single extruder multi-pass technique I've shared in previous videos. And that's how I got the really smooth, clean graphic on this case. I did the same thing for this waveform case. And this one printed out a bit messy, but I kind of like how those wisps of black got baked into the print. It makes it look a little more natural and artsy. Now, here is the last case that I was saving for last because it involved a little extra post-processing and I tried some new techniques to get this super shiny finish. It's definitely the shiniest print I own and it took a bit of work to get there. This case also uses the multi-pass technique to achieve multicolor with a single extruder. So I'll start out by printing each of these different waveforms one by one in their respective colors. Here's a cool close-up action shot so you can see how the nozzle lifts up during travel using that Z-hop feature to avoid running into the previously printed colors. Here I am swapping out to the final color, which is the black background. So it'll start by filling in all the gaps between these waveforms, and then it'll actually print on top of those colors and complete the rest of the case. 
Unfortunately, this first layer didn't come out completely clean, so I decided to do a bit of post-processing, which basically just means a whole lot of sanding. I'll start out with this relatively rough 120 grit sandpaper, which will sand away the deeper gaps and scratches on this model. Once that surface looks pretty uniformly sanded, we'll move up to a higher grit, in this case, 320. I'll sand away until all those 120 grit scratches are gone, and I was hoping that that would be enough sanding if I just really cake on the polyurethane. I'm using a spray-on clear gloss by Minwax here, and while the label doesn't suggest it, I find that you can spray on a pretty thick coat, and it tends to level out over time. Once it was dried, the result was, well, shiny, but scratchier than ever. I guess I'll have to do a bit more sanding. So this time I jumped straight in with the 320 grit, and I just tried to sand it a little bit better. Once again, I set it up outside, caked on that polyurethane. After 24 hours, I'm left with this finish, which is a little bit more satin than before. And it's also really starting to pick up lots of dust from my less than immaculate workspace. So I guess you can't avoid serious sanding if you really want a nice polish. Although I'm gonna try something a little bit different. Here we have some Zona polishing paper, which was actually recommended by a viewer in my resin printing video. This pack comes with six color-coded sheets of reusable polishing paper that go from a 30 micron polish all the way down to a one micron polish. I've got this flat sheet of styrene, which will be my polishing surface. And I'll just go ahead and clamp this polishing paper down to my workbench, add a bit of water, and we'll go ahead and see if we can polish this surface. Once I can figure out just how to rub this down. All right, this circular motion works quite well. So off we go, running through each of the colors one by one, being careful not to add any scratches along the way. All right, let's wrap things up with the one micron polishing paper. Once we dry that off, we're left with a really nice looking surface. At this point, there's barely any evidence that this thing was 3D printed. Although there are still some minor scratches and some areas have a bit of polyurethane while others are sanded all the way through to the PLA. It's not perfect, but it's as much polishing as I'm willing to do for this particular print. So let's go ahead and apply a final coat of polyurethane and see what the end result looks like. Let me go ahead and run this one right inside so I hopefully prevent more dust from getting on there. Here's what we've got by now, and it's still not perfect, but it's definitely the best finish I've been able to get. Now it's probably worth mentioning that you can get a really clean glossy finish by just printing on a very clean glass build plate, but I still think the polyurethane takes things one step further. This is one of those things where I could have worked on it forever, just sanding it and polishing it more and more, but I'm already really excited about getting it to this point where it doesn't really look like a 3D print anymore, and it's just got an absolutely beautiful shine to it even though there are some imperfections. But uh, I'm definitely gonna wanna keep playing around with this technique and seeing if I can get it absolutely perfect. So if you guys have any suggestions, please share. So those are my OP1 cases, super fun, super exciting, and I just really like creating two-dimensional art like this on 3D printed objects. Well, I've addressed everything on the table, but there's one more thing I wanna do for this video, and that is to make some more 3D pen Patreon pixels. If you're out of the loop, I've been making these 3D pen pixels for anyone who supports me on Patreon, and you can always still join in. I appreciate the support so much, and it's fun to say thank you by making these little pixels that you guys request. And in the past, I've made entire videos where I do a handful of these at a time, but I'm not getting requests quite as quickly as I used to, 
and I want to get some more pixels out there. So I figured why not just throw a couple into the end of videos here and there. And so that's what we'll do. Let's just make three or so pixels and then we'll call it a day. All right, our first pegboard pixel for today is gonna be for Wexter. And Wexter is actually a fellow prolific designer over at my mini factory. For his pixel, Wexter asked for a surprise. So I thought I'd draw out one of his popular little minifig prints resembling the artist himself. If you haven't seen Wexter's minifigs in the wild, they're these little thumb-like dudes with pretty cartoony characteristics. So I'll just draw in those simple black eyes and some distinguishing facial hair. And let's also get some clothes on here for crying out loud. We gotta be decent. Cool, there's my little Wexter minifig. Our next pixel request comes from Suxty, who asked me to draw a trans flag. Now, I've already drawn one of these for a previous pixel, so this time around I thought I'd switch it up and make the flag kind of wavy and diagonal, just to give it some extra style. And I think that ended up looking really cool. Finally, here's a pixel for patron Druzy Q, who asked me for an Australian sapphire, which is this blue gemstone. So I'll start out by kind of planning the facets of this gem, and then I'll start adding in all these different shades of blue to try to create a more shiny effect. It's pretty tricky to pull this off with a 3D pen, but I'm gonna give it my best shot. I can add these white edges as well to act as highlights. And there we go, that's my 3D pen gemstone. Awesome, so there's a handful of new pixels to add to the collection. And this bot, well, it could be yours. All right, friends, that's gonna wrap it up for today's video. I hope you enjoyed all of my cool prints. As always, I'll have links in the description if you wanna print any of these files for yourself. And if you want to support me and get your own Patreon pixel, you can also become a Patreon supporter, which I definitely appreciate, especially in times like these. But that's going to be it for today, so I'll see you in the next one. Until then, I'm Devin, this is Make Anything, and as always, stay inspired. <laughs>